Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Miss Angler's biology classroom. I am Miss Angler, and in today's video, we are going to be looking at reproductive strategies in vertebrates. Now, if you're new here, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up, subscribe, and turn your notifications on because I post regularly on Tuesdays and Thursdays with fresh content for grades 8 to 12. Now, the core content of today's video is going to focus around the different ways in which vertebrates reproduce, what are the advantages and disadvantages of each of them, and I'm going to highlight all the really important stuff that you need to know for your exams. So what is the purpose of having so many different reproductive strategies amongst animals? Remember, the goal in the animal kingdom is to produce more of yourself. In actual fact, that is the goal of all living organisms. Make more of yourself. And so in order to do that, different animals have different strategies which allow them to make as many of them as possible with either the most resources available or with very few resources available. Now, an important step in reproduction is fertilization, which refers to when an egg cell and a sperm cell combine together in order to form an embryo. And there are two main kinds of fertilization that occur in the animal kingdom, and that is external fertilization and internal. We're going to focus first on the external fertilization. Now, when you study this particular topic, you need to be very familiar with the advantages and the disadvantages of the types of fertilization. Now, in the photograph in front of you, you can see a frog and and you can see that it's made thousands of eggs and you'll notice it's in water. Now, this is an important thing for external fertilization because a key feature of external fertilization is making many, many eggs, often in an aquatic environment. And it requires very little parental care once they are actually laid. Now, because there's so many eggs, um, frogs are trying to increase the chances of fertilization because no one's actually hanging around the eggs. We don't actually know for certain whether or not they'll get fertilized. So let's have a look at some of the key facts you will need to know for your exam about external fertilization. Now, first things first, when we define it, we are looking for things like external fertilization is when gametes, the egg cells and the sperm cells, join outside of the body. There are often a large number of gametes, as we can see, a large number of egg cells along with sperm cells, and it is occurring in water. Now, in terms of the advantages, the parents don't need to be in the same location, which is great because what it means is like this frog, she can lay her eggs and she doesn't have to be around waiting for a male to fertilize them. A male can simply swim past, find the eggs and fertilize them, which means it requires very little energy to find a mate. The disadvantage, however, is the chance of fertilization. That means that she can lay all these eggs, and if nobody swims past, they'll never get fertilized. The good thing, however, is that these eggs that she laid, you can see they're very simple. They're actually just like a gelatinous ball. They don't require a lot of energy, and that's why she can make so many of them. Is it wasteful? It can be. However, she puts very, very little effort into making so many of them. The next form of fertilization is internal fertilization. Now, this occurs mostly in terrestrial animals. So we're talking reptiles, birds, and mammals. And because there's no external water for sperm to swim in, the male gametes, the sperm cells, need to be released directly into the body of the female. Now, this comes with advantages and some disadvantages. So let's have a look at those side by side along with the external fertilization again so we can make a clear comparison. So in our table here, we have, let's look at the internal. Internal gametes are now inside the body. The requirements is you're going to need a specialized organ. You're either going to need a penis and vagina. You're going to have something called a cloaca. You need some kind of reproductive organ. And there is going to be a mating ritual in order for there to be fertilization to occur. Now, the advantages is that there's going to be a much greater chance of fertilization. And that is because... Um, the sperm cells are released inside of the female, which means that they are really close um, in, into contact with the egg cells. Um, another advantage is that you don't need to make as many gametes. Because you are 
uh, ensuring that the gametes are very close to one another, it ensures fertilization. It means sperm cells don't have to swim very far. They're very close. They're not going to be washed away. Um, it's not going to be destroyed by sunlight. And so it increases the chances of fertilization. The disadvantage, however, is that the parents must be in the same location at the same time. In other words, more effort needs to be placed in finding a mate. And if the conditions are not right, it is often very difficult for infer internal fertilization to occur. Now we're going to take a look at what happens after fertilization. Do we lay an egg? Do we give birth to live young? What are the options? Now for this, I'm going to use sharks as my example for each one of the different ways in which offspring can be birthed or laid in terms of eggs. Please know that there are plenty of other examples of animals under each of these categories. I'm only using sharks because they actually fall into all three categories. There are examples of species that are are oviparous, oviviparous, and viviparous. I know the words are very similar, and don't worry, we'll unpack each of them now so you know what they mean. But I'm going to use them as my example so it's uniform and continuous throughout. And we'll start with ovipary. Now, when you see the word ovi or ova, I want you to think of egg. This is an example of a shark that will lay an egg. In other words, fertilization will occur internally and the egg will be laid. And sometimes they're known as mermaid's purses and they come in all these beautiful shapes that you can see over here. And essentially ovipary means that the um, baby or the embryo is going to grow outside the female's body. And so some defining characteristics of ovipary is that the eggs develop outside of the parent and that the egg yolk that is on the inside is the only source of food to the shark while it is growing. Now, there are some advantages to this kind of, um, let's call it egg production. And that is the eggs contain a lot of nutrients inside them, particularly the yolk. There is protection from the elements. Generally, the shell of the egg is quite thick. There's also incubation, which means it keeps it warm and safe. And finally, most animals that lay eggs provide parental care. Now, sharks are just one kind of an example of an animal that lays eggs. There are other animals. Think of like a chicken or a snake or a lizard. They all lay eggs and they would also fall into this category. Now, in any test or an exam, you will be expected to draw one of these eggs that we spoke about now, specifically the amniotic egg. You should be able to draw it, label it, and also tell me the functions of all of the structures that we find inside of it. And I'm going to quickly recap all of them. We'll start off with the outermost layer, which is the shell. This is going to provide protection. It's going to incubate the egg and keep it safe. If we move one layer in, you'll see something called the albumin, which is, if you've cracked a chicken egg open before, it's the egg white part, and essentially it allows for the um, developing embryo to float uh, so that it's undamaged. Then we move on to the chorion. Now, the chorion specifically surrounds all the other membranes, and it's responsible for gaseous exchange. In other words, that little embryo growing in there needs to exchange gases. It needs to be able to exchange oxygen with carbon dioxide and basically breathe. Now, in placental animals, you have your placenta, and you have an umbilical cord, and this will allow you to exchange gases with your mother. But eggs don't have that. Remember, they're outside of the female. The next layer beyond that is the amnion. Now, the amnion and the amniotic fluid are linked together. The amnion is the membrane, and the fluid is what fills that membrane. And the amnion is responsible for protecting against dehydration and mechanical injury so that they can float around and be safe. Beyond that, we then have the allium toys. Now, the allium toys is responsible for collecting nitrogenous wastes. Essentially, as that little embryo grows, you need somewhere to put all the wastes it makes. And so it's stored away in the allium toys. 
The next two labels are fairly straightforward. We have the embryo, which is the developing um, fetus. And finally, we have the yolk sac. And the yolk sac is literally, as you imagine, a chicken egg. It's the yolk. It's the yellow part of the egg. That's where all the nutrients come from to grow that embryo. Remember, the eggs are not inside the female anymore. So somebody has to feed this growing embryo. The next reproductive strategy is ovovivipary. I know it's a mouthful and it probably looks very similar to the one we've just now because it sounds the same and it looks like there's eggs, but there's a few major changes. Yes, yet again, the name has the word ovo in it, which means egg, but vivipary means to give birth live. So we're not laying any eggs this time. And again, I'm going to use a, a different species of shark as an example. Now, these particular sharks um, have internal fertilization, as we know, but the eggs are kept on the inside of the shark. And as you can see here at this little bottom picture, the shark is going to carry the eggs until they hatch, and they're going to hatch inside of the female's body. And so when we talk about ovovivipary, eggs are kept inside and offspring is often born alive. It sometimes is confusing because that makes them look like mammals, but it's, it's not. They're actually hatched on the inside. And sometimes what they do for nutrition, if we look on the other side of the picture, is these little sharks will either have a yolk sac, as you can see in this uh, top picture over here in the corner, you've got a little yolk sac. They might eat uh, their fellow siblings who weren't fertilized, unfortunately for them, or there's like a milky-like substance that is secreted by the mother into her reproductive system for them to feed off of. And so they grow inside the female, they become mature, and they're still inside their egg. It's important, okay? They haven't left their egg casing, but these eggs are a bit softer. They don't have a hard shell. And eventually they're born live and they can swim around and they don't actually don't need their parents after that. So let's look at those advantages of being over viviparous. There are fewer eggs, which is important because it means you're going to put less effort um, into protecting them and rather more effort into making the eggs. Your embryo is less vulnerable because it's inside the female. It's protected by the female herself. And lastly, young are born fully developed, which is really important because what that means is they can literally be born and they can swim away. They don't have to be nursed by their parent. The parent put all the energy into growing them and now they can go off and they can live freely without their parent. The final category of our reproductive strategies is vivipary. And this is where we fall into this category where we give birth to live young. And that's what the vivipary means to, to bear live living young. And again, I'm going to use one of my little sharks here as an example. Certain species of sharks do give birth to live young. So what does it mean to be viviparous? Essentially, it means your eggs do not have a shell around them and our animals, our offspring are born living. Now, if we look at our little shark here, you can see that the shark, along with animals uh, like uh, humans and chimpanzees and cats and dogs, they all fall into this category. And all of the small embryos or the babies are held inside the body and they grow inside the body. And they have something called a placenta, which we can see over here is this um, sac that is attached to them by the uh, umbilical cord. That's what actually gives you your belly button is the connection between you, your placenta and and your mother. And that means some sharks also have a belly button. Isn't that funny to think about it? But essentially the placenta allows nutrients and wastes to be exchanged between the mother and the baby. And what that does is it gives us certain advantages. Those advantages include a reduced number of eggs because the fewer the eggs, the more effort the mother can put into parental care and looking after her babies as they grow inside of her. It also provides extra nutrition. And lastly, that parental care that I mentioned earlier is really important because Essentially, it means that the mother put all this effort into growing her babies on the inside. Now that she's birthed them, she doesn't want them to die straight away. She, she's put all that effort in. So she's going to continue to put effort in and look after them um, to ensure that they survive to reproductive age as well. Now that we've looked at fertilization, we've looked at the formation of the embryo and how we grow it either in an egg or not in an egg, what happens after the animal comes out of its egg or out of its mother, how do they develop? And so the development stage is either going to be a precocial one 
or altricial. Let's look at the precocial first. And so that's the example running down the left-hand side. Animals that are born with a precocial um, strategy means that they are born ready to go. You will notice my example here is of a little chicken. You will see that it has its fur, it can, or it's like fluffy down feathers. It can stand, it can see, it can move around, it can find food. Does it follow its mother around? Yes, for a limited amount of time and protection, but that little baby chicken is free to roam around as it pleases. On the other hand, you have altricial development, and this is where animals are born blind, naked, which means they have no hair, no fur. And you can see that on this side with this example of this kind of bird, you'll see that they don't have their eyes open. They don't have any feathers yet. They're in the nest. They can't walk. They can't fly. And so they are very reliant on their parents to provide them with food and protection. Both of these strategies are dependent on the resources available to those species. As always, I like to end off my lessons with a terminology recap. Now, you can use all of these words for your flashcards, which is the best way to study. Now, we looked at types of fertilization. Internal fertilization happens inside of the female, and it ensures that the sperm cell meets the egg, whereas external fertilization happens on the outside of the female. And in order to make up for the fact that we might not ensure sperm meet the egg, we make many, many, many eggs to make up for that. We then looked at the developmental options, the way in which the embryo is going to develop, and we looked at ovipary. Ovipary is when a hard-shelled egg is laid outside of the female body, and we call this egg the amniotic egg. The amniotic egg has the chorion, the amnion, the allantois, and the yolk, each providing a different nutrition or a waste function for that embryo as it develops. We then moved on to ovovivipary, which is when eggs are held within the female's body. The embryo develops inside the egg. They hatch inside the mother first, and then she gives birth to live young. Finally, we look to, for vivipary. Vivipary is where we fall in as humans, and these organisms give birth to live young, and they have a placenta sharing nutrients as well as wastes with their mother. Lastly, we looked at what we would call a developmental stage after birth, and we looked at precocial and altricial. Precocial means that these organisms are born able to walk around, see, and fend for themselves. Altricial are organisms that are unable to look after themselves. They're often blind, hairless, and very vulnerable to predation. Now, as always, if you've enjoyed this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up like and subscribe, turn your notifications on everybody because I post regularly on Tuesdays and Thursdays for grade 8 to 12 and I'll see you all again soon. Bye!